So I'm excited to have you on. Uh, Ian Landsman, you are the founder of uh, HelpSpot, a uh, ticketing system for support teams. Uh, you've got a few other things going on as well, an interesting background in the Laravel ecosystem. So i uh, love to just kind of you know introduce you here and have you give a, a quick overview of yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's uh, great to make this work and get on here. Um, yeah, so yeah, bootstrapped uh, what is now a more mostly a SaaS um, help desk application called HelpSpot almost 20 years ago now, which is crazy. SaaS is, SaaS is uh, getting old with us, I guess. Um, but then, yeah, I've been around Laravel a lot, uh, run Lara jobs, run Laracon online, did the first two Laracon live conferences with Taylor. Um, way back in the day now, like, I guess, over 10 years ago. Um, so yeah, so it's been quite a cool ride. A uh, couple, couple learnings to share, I guess. And then, I'll, uh, you know, I think people sometimes just like to hear about, you know, how things went or uh, advice in different areas. So yeah, happy to talk yeah. about whatever you'd like to cover. Yeah, cool. I let, Let's dive into help spot because that's an interesting yeah. space. I, I think that, uh, especially now with AI, there's like all these, uh, you know, right. chat bots coming out, you know, Zendesk is, you know, a big one in the space. And you were like early, early in the scene. I, I'd love to just kind of like dive into that. Like, were, were you literally the first SaaS for, for like support? Well, ticketing? So this is a funny story. Um, so no, we weren't the first SaaS. So we were, so we were very early, like three, four years before Zendesk, way before Help Scout and all those kind of ones. Um, and we actually started as uh, on-premise, and we still sell on-premise to this day. So you can download HelpSpot, install it on your own servers, um, and just fully manage it yourself. But we also now, you know, maybe like ten years ago, built a a sassified version of it. So it's actually still like the on-premise version, but we spin up a virtual machine on AWS and you know build it all out and just automate all that. But um, but it's actually still the on-premise version, essentially. So it's not your standard pure SaaS where, you know, it's like a multi-tenant database and things like that. It's uh, it's everybody gets their own instance. They get their own database uh, database on a single database server, but it's still like a multi-database uh, setup. And so, yeah, so it's sort of interesting. It's uh, so that was super early, right? That's, I mean, it was literally at the same time as like Basecamp. Um, but I didn't know so like 2002 Ruby. or something or yeah, it was, um, my help spot was 2000. I started in 2004 and we kind of started selling it in 2005. So, yeah. So, you know, none, there was no infrastructure, right? Like our, my company website was on a physical server I owned, you know, <laughs> in a rack somewhere in Arizona. And so, you know, there was no AWS, there's no Linux, there's none of this stuff. Right. So, um, so very in the beginning, I was like, well, should I do this as like what we now call SaaS? Um, Cause I was like, oh, Basecamp's doing it. And then, you know, obviously a few other things, but I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know how to, I knew the basics of running servers, but I didn't know how to run to scale a server or to do any of that stuff. So I was like, you know what, it's gonna be, it's it's just not gonna work. So we just did the on-premise um, and it's worked out great. I mean, I think if we had done the SaaS, who knows, it's like there's a, 10% chance that help spot would be Zendesk essentially like one of the first SaaS help desk. Oh, but I think there's also a 90% chance that, you know, it just would have crushed and died. Um, cause I didn't know anything about running servers and, uh, I wouldn't be here today. So, <laughs> so I think it's for the most part worked out for the best. Um, you also, you got to remember in that 2004 range, like that's post.com. There was no money. There's no VC. Like all that stuff was totally dead. So, uh, it was just whatever, you know, we literally sold our car. Um, and just to raise money, my wife had a job to support us while I went off and built the first version of HelpSpot. And yeah, and back then, you know, no framework, no Laravel, no really frameworks of any kind. Um, it was even before like, uh, oh, what was that really early framework? Uh, like CodeIgniter uh, or something? Yeah, CodeIgniter. Yeah, so it was before CodeIgniter. Um, so yeah, so I literally wrote every line of code, right? I wrote every line of PHP. I had the JavaScript Bible on my lap and I'd be like <laughs> learning JavaScript via this, you know, four inch thick JavaScript Bible because I didn't really know JavaScript. So yeah, I wrote every single line of code. Um, and obviously now when you start a new project and you're like new up a Laravel project, it's like, oh, there's 
a million lines of code in there already written for you and it does everything right it does authentication and it's got caching and it's got databases and the orm and everything and you're just like oh i wrote every line of my half-ass version of all those things <laughs> uh 18 years ago so you're crazy. replatforming it aren't you I, I think you mentioned something about that yeah, we're working on a new version. So uh, we haven't got too deep in that yet, but that's definitely something we're going to be be doing is, uh, you know, it's been a long time out there. So we're we're working on a new version. Uh, not ready to talk about it yet, but there's going to be some cool stuff with that coming. Yeah. All right. So cool. it's, yeah, it's, it's I, I won't press you on that one. Yeah, maybe we'll go, <laughs> come back on and talk about some some new stuff uh, in eight months, 10 months. But um, yeah, you know, it's it's really cool. That, that's given me as I'm working on both that and other uh, things we do here. It's like just being I'm like all the time reminded about how awesome our, the tools we have now are and uh, just how quick and easy it is to get rolling with something. And like in a day you can have, you know, something where like you can log into it and it's outputting information and you're submitting information and it's doing something useful, uh, even if it's not a polished app right in a day. But it is remarkable how far we've come with uh, all these tools. Yeah, I mean, it's. I had uh, my my executive coach Mike Krupit. He came on uh, one of the early episodes here on Cashflow, and he's uh, he's like a dot com era founder CEO. Uh, he's mm -hmm. probably done I think like eight companies or something, a couple IPOs, and one of his companies he was uh, you know originally hired in as the CTO, and then eventually uh, became the the CEO. I think Josh Koppelman was actually the founder. Uh, Mm. uh from first round capital but it, it was called cd now it was like back in like 1996 1998 oh, wow. uh back right. in that era <laughs> and it was basically just an e-commerce website for selling cds yep. and they had raised like i don't i don't know what the number it was but it was like many millions i think it was right. probably like eight figures or maybe nine figures uh, probably eight figures but uh they raised a crap load of money and uh and like all of that money was deployed like a lot of it was deployed for like racking servers and right. for hiring this like <laughs> massive team of like html coders to build yep. <laughs> to build an e-commerce website <laughs> yeah we had my first job on the internet um me and my wife actually worked in the same place and it was this little startup -y type thing started by professors from the college uh we went to and what they were doing was like the very first like online courses and um uh, my wife's job there actually was just like we just had an army of college students and all they did all day was take word documents and just translate them into html and upload them into the course management system um that was used by like prentice hall a big textbook publisher um so yeah it's like that is so funny how a lot of those things back then were like yeah just yeah, we're just doing p tags here just like we have 20 people just p tagging this thing up because there's no other way to do it like that's what we're doing um yeah, it sounds like straight out of office funny. space <laughs> right <laughs> kind of was like that actually oh that's man that's crazy. cool so uh awesome so what's like uh like tell, tell me about like the use case of help spot like who who like who do you serve what types of customers and you know how are they using it and how does it stand out from other uh you know help desk or uh you know, like ticketing support systems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so HelpSpot um, is used, you know, that's kind of interesting thing about Helpdesk software is it's used in almost every company. And then even within a single company or organization, there might be multiple help desks, and there might also be things that are help desks, but even the people who use them don't call them help desks. So uh, there's really a ton of, you know, it's in every industry, every vertical. And so um, kind of our core bread and butter customer would be uh, like a big company where we are in a department of it uh, or a medium sized company where we are the entire customer like support platform. Um, but it's also has a lot of so that's like your traditional like standard like IT use case like an IT organization uses it to manage IT ticketing for people with IT problems. Um, then there's also the other side of it, which is sort of just customer and user customer service. So, you know, you sell a product and you're just managing those primarily email accounts in our case where people are maybe asking for refunds or questions or whatever the case may be and HelpSpot manages all that for you. Um, and then there's other use cases like HR departments deal with a lot of email. And so they'll use something like HelpSpot to manage that in some cases. That's actually an area where we've seen quite a bit of growth, actually. Um, maintenance departments for like buildings and things like that. 
So a lot of like higher ed, a lot of K-12 finance, um, you know, just uh, manufacturing, shipping companies, like literally just everything. Like if they get email, uh, they have some kind of solution like this, which, you know, is why it's probably the most competitive SaaS space or one of the most competitive SaaS spaces. I mean, there are literally thousands of help desk uh, products out there. And certainly like there's Zendesk, which is like the big whale, but you know, well, there's, there's thousands, you're thousands saying? of others. Yeah. There's, there's many, many, many things that either do it entirely, which is a lot of them. There's other things like HubSpot has like a help desk. Salesforce has a help desk. Like they all, you know, a lot of these other CRM type tools have help desks kind of baked into them to some degree. Usually those are, you know, a little more half baked sort of not the best tools, but, um, yeah, so there's like literally thousands of options. Um, and it's then plus you're always, space. yeah, you're also competing with just email, right? Like, well, people will just be in Outlook and they'll just have a shared mailbox and they'll just manage it that way for a while until that gets, you know, cumbersome because there's four or five or 10 people trying to share a mailbox. And obviously that breaks down and then those people will come uh, looking for a more organized solution. But uh, yeah, there's like new help desk competitors all the time. Like, I do not ever even keep track of them. I don't look at them. It's like they're all irrelevant because there's just so many. It doesn't even matter. It's like, okay, like one more. Who cares? Like they're not doing, um, you know, <laughs> they're not unlikely to be doing anything that different than the other thousand of them. So, uh, yeah, so you do have to find your niches. It is um, super competitive. And, you know, we're bootstrapped. We're still small. Like it was never my goal to like blow it out into this big company. And so, uh, you know, I've never taken any investment at all. And uh, so, yeah, we can't outspend a Zendesk, right? Like Zendesk. So in, if you uh, want to buy Google ads for help desk software, like the exact term help desk software, it's like $140 a click. Wow, and so, it, yeah, so like, you know, we can't do that. Like, there's no way we could afford to do that. Um, whereas, you know, obviously Zendesk is a public company or, the VC back startups in the help desk space will always, you know, we'll start there and they'll be like, all right, well, we're going to pay a hundred dollars a click and try to convert some customers. And we're going to blow this VC money. Right. Cause we have money. We have to spend it somehow or another. So that's going to be one of the ways we spend it. But have you uh, checked out Microsoft ads? I have not done much with Microsoft ads. It's an interesting, like under the radar. I just, I started, you know, getting into it recently. Interesting. Uh, they, so Microsoft ads manager, Okay. Uh, Powers, Bing, Yahoo, mm -hmm. DuckDuckGo, and a few other things. Okay. Uh, and it's like huh. way cheaper than Google. It's insane. Right. Yeah, I'm sure it's way cheaper. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I, you know, I will be very interested to see what it what the price is for like help desk software and similar terms to that. Um, because that would be interesting. I mean, yeah, if it's like ten bucks a click, I mean, I still love it, but it's probably feasible at least. Um, but yeah, the the hundred dollar click. I mean, it's sort of unbelievable. You can charge a hundred dollars a click, really. Yeah, I mean, ten ten bucks <laughs> a click, though. That's pretty good. I mean, that's um, yeah, that would be reasonable. Yeah, I mean, even if it's like twenty or thirty, I'd imagine. I I don't know what your MRR on an average customer is, but you probably would. Even if you spend like what two three hundred dollars to acquire a customer, right, that's probably that would be good. fine. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, that would be fine. Um, you know, the thing with these ad things too is it's like how many real leads are you even getting like when at 140 dollars a click how much fake clicking is going on and stuff yeah. there's a lot of like competition up there at that like whenever we've tried to run ads they've been especially bad like way worse than organic um which seems weird because like somebody's searching for your specific tool you would presumably you know do okay um so yeah i don't know uh but that is something to look at. I like that idea of definitely if it was in the, the 10, 20, 30 bucks. And then, yeah, even if it's, you know, you're paying $500, that's fine. You know, a thousand dollars would be fine. That would work for us. Um, yeah, you should probably get like a five or 10% conversion rate, I'd guess. Like if you have like really targeted, right. you know, clicks, you, sh you should probably get like a five or 10% conversion rate on, on those clicks. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a little, it's sort of interesting too, the whole process, because it's a really, it's a pretty enterprisey type app. I mean, there are, you know, there's different help desk apps all over the market that are focused in different areas. But for us, um, since we are more of this, like on the enterprise end, we're definitely not at the enterprise 
price point and we're not like consulting where we're going to go and do a big implementation for you for half a million dollars and things like that. So it is like all self-service for the most part and things along those lines. But um, we do tend to primarily sell into these like bigger orgs, like smaller departments and bigger orgs and things like that. So um, yeah, it's kind of interesting how to manage that. And then when you get a, a, a click or whatever, right? It's like not usually a person who's just going to buy right there. It's often like, well, they're researching and then they're going to go bring it back to the committee. The committee is analyzing seven options. Uh, they have a list of questions, you know? So like, yeah, we do get people who just show up and buy, but that is definitely the exception to the rule. It's usually more of a, like they want a demo um, and that whole kind of thing. So it's a little bit different than you're kind of, what a lot of people might have is like uh, their SaaS these days where they're really optimizing for, you know, total self-service and people being able to convert instantly because like you're the decision maker is the one on the page. Like that's very often not the case for us that the decision maker is the one looking at it. Um, it's, I don't think enterprise SaaS though is really conducive for product like growth though. I mean, I think, I think that was like a big buzzword. Like everyone was trying mm. to do, you know, product like growth for, for everything. And I think mm. it really works for like, you know, either uh, like, you know, the B to B to C kind of like the B to C to B kind of thing or whatever that's called or, you know, like consumer products, but definitely right. like those, you know, tools like Slack or, you know, like Google Workspace, like those are great products like growth uh, examples. But when you get into like the enterprise SaaS, I don't think it really works uh, to do that because there's so much like onboarding and customization and spin right. up that needs to happen. Yeah, exactly. And there are different parts of the market. It's like, it's like it is. It's like every company and every department, every every company practically. So there are all these little edges and um, things where I think like we could do stuff better. That's part of like what we're going to be working on and the newer uh, stuff we're doing down the line a little bit is, you know, can we optimize certain areas to be a little easier to onboard and things like that? So we definitely have some ideas there. But yeah, there is just more touch required um even if it's just answering questions or having whether it's even like a good pre-recorded demo that's like a real demo not just like a you know one minute like little walkthrough but like a real demo or do actual demos which is what we generally do um although we do have recorded demos also but we primarily do it uh, right now do one-on-one -on -one demos when um people want them so and we do a fair amount of them so yeah, uh, those are all the things that there's tons. I mean, the enterprise sales is a whole, I mean, we could have a whole discussion about that, but there's all kinds of things in that. I think people are like, oh, we're just going to have credit cards and like take that. But I mean, more than half our customers don't pay with credit card. Um, they pay with invoice, uh, you know, so we invoice them and then they pay with check or they pay um, with bank Dude, transfer. I can't believe people are still using checks. I, I know, it's, it's we, crazy. We, we get a we ton move. of checks at Kira. It's like, I can't believe it. It's crazy. Yep. They love the checks. I don't know. So <laughs> I would like to get away from that one. At least like the bank transfer or or card uh, would be great. The checks are definitely not my favorite. It's like, you got to go get the check and you got to go to the bank. And that, now at least it's a little better because you can mostly just um, deposit them through the mobile app, which is much better than the old days of always having to go to the bank for every like here's a 299 dollar check like i go to the bank which i mean sounds like a sob story but i mean whatever it's kind of annoying because <laughs> it's like i gotta make a separate trip to the bank so uh yeah so that, that's an area we're kind of working on to at least get people onto the ach and the uh, wire transfers but you know purchase orders um and things like that so there's just a, there is a lot out there depending on like your price point and what types of organizations you sell to where um uh, there can be other types of expectations there besides just you throw stripe in there and forget about it yeah it, it does like you know SaaS paints this picture of like everything's automated it's all like this right. beautiful <laughs> elegant software and like when you dive into some of these SaaS companies especially even some of the big ones there's it's like amazing mm -hmm. how much manual human product ops are actually oh, sure. behind some of these companies like obviously you have the csm teams and the sales teams are doing you know human to human uh mm -hmm. contact but even like you know i i heard a story about zenefits i don't know if you remember zenefits uh mm -hmm. they had uh when they were scaling up in that big like unicorn uh hype phase where they were like right. you know 50 million in revenue with like a whatever you know multi-billion dollar like i think it was almost 10 billion dollar valuation 
Right. And it was like one of those wacky, you know, uh, like hype cycle valuations, uh, you know, 10 years ago or something at this point. Yep. Uh, they, uh, I heard a story about how they were ba- like their product was a lot of uh, like it had this really like nice interface and it, you were doing things in the interface, like buying insurance or running payroll. And it looked like you were, looked like you were like right. putting stuff into doing the system. It. And, right. and it was like, the system was doing it, but it was really just like forms going right. into a queue and people were just I like, think I haven't heard that story actually. Yeah. <laughs> just people are just like, back army. there. Right. They're just back there actually then calling the insurance company and being like, okay, like here's the person's what I need. Like, yeah, I think that is definitely uh, a thing for sure. And um, yeah, we have that ourselves in a number of areas where it's like, yeah, we're just physically doing stuff here <laughs> as humans uh, talking to an accounts payable department or um, yeah, whatever the case may be. So yeah, there's a lot of that stuff where it's especially, I mean, we're not big at all, but even just as you scale up a tiny bit, um, there is just a lot of that stuff where just people want custom deals because there's something, they have some weird use case or whatever, and then maybe you're inclined to do it if it's early on and you're like, well, it's going to be a huge sale, right? But now you have to do this custom sort of weird thing or you're signing a special agreement that's in addition to your regular terms. Or like there's always something kind of going on there. And you got all these like if customer ID equals in your code. <laughs> <laughs> I've always tried to avoid that, but uh, but yeah, there can be stuff along those lines. With customer oh, specific stuff, I've always done. Uh, we've given them the option to basically like we've only actually done this maybe four or five times, but if they really needed something and they're like, we'll pay you for it, whatever. Um, and we would have them. We have like professional services too, which will just do stuff like with our API and things like that. But and then I have given people in the past like uh the option to basically like move something to the front of the line so it's like still our ip we own it we'll but we'll add this feature for you for you know but it's going to be five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or whatever to like just basically prioritize it um and then we will add it as a feature rather than building it like as something through the api or if it's something that's useful potentially for other customers um do you get pushback on that uh not in the times i I would i never it's not the kind of thing we actively like sell it's the kind of thing where they're asking for and want to pay for a solution to this and it's like okay well how about this and yeah they're always fine with it um i've never i've heard from a lot of friends that have SaaS businesses that they'll say things like you know the the customer will come in and ask for all these custom features and then Mm. we'll quote them to build it and then also tell them we're going to roll it into the product and they're like oh well why am i paying for it if you're just going to roll it into the product why don't you put the r&d (laughs) <laughs> well, that's where I've always framed it as like prioritizing it. So it's like, yeah, I mean, this, I mean, it's rare that you're even ever hearing something that we ha- don't already know about um, occasionally. But most of the time, it's like, yeah, this is something we are considering doing or planning doing, but it's just we're not doing it right now. And there's other things ahead of it. Um, but if you want to, like, basically fund the prioritization of it, then that works. Um, we haven't done that in quite a while. It was definitely more of a thing. A little bit earlier on, I would say, where just like there was just bigger chunks missing of things that people wanted. And it's like, OK, uh, you know, that would make that happen and be a little extra revenue for the company at that time. But. Yeah, it, I think it's viable. Um, yeah, I mean, it depends what you try to charge, too. Right. I, I never really had a crazy number there for those things and it was never a problem. But sure, if you said one hundred thousand dollars, then that might get a little more pushback of like well if you're just going to put this in the product like and it's going to happen in six months we'll just wait to six months or whatever so i think there is some elements of how much are you charging how much are you asking to do this customization or prioritization um and then the balance there with that yeah yeah cool i want to take a quick break from the episode and say if you're enjoying this content the best way you can say thank you is to subscribe so if you're on youtube hit the subscribe button and the notification bell And if you're on one of the podcast platforms, hit the subscribe button there as well. And also share it out to your friends and colleagues. If you find this content useful and you think other people will enjoy it as well, please send it out. And back to the episode. So uh, the last question on HelpSpot, uh, I was curious, we kind of like touched on it a little bit, but like what's your guys go to market strategy if you're not doing like PPC or uh, like, you know, paid, paid media, like how, Mm -hmm. how do you guys acquire customers and, you know, fill your lead funnel? Yeah. So, I mean, this is like a couple parts of the story. So what's sort of interesting is we got to sort of a good place pretty early on in the company. Um, at least in terms of like way, making way more than I made, 
you know, working at a job and all those kind of things. And so then we started having kids. We have three kids now. And and you're just a quick, 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 quick uh, rewind. Your your wife's your business partner too on the business, right? Yeah, especially early on, like we did it together. <laughs> um, and then once we had the kids and everything, she's kind of you know she still helps out with some of the business end things like insurance, and we use Just Works, kind of like managing with them and things like that. So she's still involved in that way, um, and also definitely is kind of a uh, I guess you like an advisor almost um, where like. You know, I go to her with different ideas and she tells me I'm nuts or things like that <laughs> um, and and those kind of things. So, but yeah, she's still involved. And, but yeah, so we kind of hit this level where it's like, okay, like we make enough money. We got the kids, like it's tons of work with the kids and didn't really do much with any of that stuff. Um, we still had the foundation of what we'd been doing, which is uh, SEO. So that was always our main thing was SEO. And, and that's still to this day, I would say the main uh, avenue, but we're actually starting to ramp up as you touched on a little bit, uh, you know, my kids are getting older, like the oldest is 17, the youngest is 10. So they're, you know, they're real, they're doing their own thing. They got stuff going on. So we're kind of entering this new phase of the business where it's like, okay, like, no, I'm ready to like work on some growth again, like work on building it up and not just have it be like, I mean, we've grown every year. But it's like, you know, modest growth and it's fine. It's like, whatever, it, it pays for the employees and me and I'm, it's been great. But now it's like, okay, like, let's see if we can grow it some more. So, uh, you know, some of it's going to be things in the new pro, the sort of like the newer version of HubSpot we're working on. That'll help with some of that. Um, some of it is we're doing more with partners um, and starting to build out that avenue because that is an avenue we can build out that doesn't require, yeah, like the trying to optimize the, the ads and all those things. Um, and you know, Google has all that stuff. So optimized. It's like, I don't know. I feel like it's a very difficult game to win there. Um, so like we talked about, you know, again, obviously maybe there's some other ad channels opening up, which would be interesting. Uh, so yeah, so, and then we've always had a strong kind of word of mouth people, you know, the help desk is the kind of tool, unlike a lot of SaaS tools, really even B2B ones, where people are using it 40 hours a week. Like they come into work and they use wow. HubSpot and then they use HubSpot all day long until they leave work. And so uh it's incredible. Yeah, so there is like a stickiness there where they're gonna take it with them to other jobs. So that's also always been the other big avenue. Um it's just you know, managers or people who become managers in other jobs, and they're like, Hey, I used HubSpot my last job and it's great and they're coming into an organization that either isn't using anything or they're using any something that's you know not supported anymore or whatever and or built in house that's another one like a lot of these companies we deal with like they may have had, built their own help desk tool some years ago and then because it wants to do that and then of course it's never properly maintained or anything like that and so now they're stuck on this thing that's never going to evolve and doesn't even work half the time properly uh, so, you know, somebody new comes in and it's like, let's get rid of this old junkie thing and, you know, bring in help spot. So uh, that's really common as well. But uh, yeah, you know, it's tricky. It's hard for uh, bootstrap companies these days and SaaS because there's definitely not a lot of the obvious sort of things to just do. You can't just throw money at it. There's way better funded competitors. And so you do, I think, something I've been thinking a lot about uh, is just that you really have to build in the marketing and kind of the hooks like into the product itself um you got to really think that through carefully which is something that i don't think i've done as good a job of as i could have and that's something that we're going to be working on going forward but are there just ways to make it um self-propel a little more uh, in terms of the business model, the features, the whole thing working together, the the marketing, the branding, the parts you can really control, and then uh, making that all work together. So in the modern kind of super competitive landscape, that stuff's really important. You ever do any like just good old fashioned sales, like cold email or cold LinkedIn, or just kind of hammer the streets? No, I haven't done too much of that. I have to say not too much of that. Um, again, it's a sort of an area we, we've... Uh, started to like do the most very basic poking around in that area not really even just with like ads on linkedin and things like that we've done a few experiments um into those other channels you talk about expensive man linkedin ads are so expensive yeah 
Yeah. Well, well, LinkedIn, you know, LinkedIn is like something I didn't pay attention to for like 15 years. Right. And then like uh, the last like few months I've been looking around and I'm like, oh, like people are actually like using this thing. It's not just like their resume. Like people are in here using it like a social network. And it's just kind of blown my mind. Um, Actually, what kind of like woke me up to it was uh, Eric Barnes of Laravel News. And he was just telling me how the Laravel News has a hundred thousand followers on LinkedIn. And I was like, whoa, really? Like people are out there on LinkedIn, like following Laravel things and stuff. So uh, that's, yeah. So I've been getting more into that. Um, I still, I have a hard time with it. I don't know. It's definitely not my first instinct on social media, just even as a person, like I do not go to LinkedIn first. Uh, so uh, that, you're more of a Twitter guy, right? I'm way uh, more X. of a Twitter guy than a, than a <laughs> LinkedIn guy. So trying to like at least show up over there once in a while and and post something but but yeah I haven't done too much of the cold you know the, it's hard because the when you get into like the cold sale stuff it's like to really do it right i feel like you need more people than i want to hire so like you know we're going to hire the two or three people and fire the ones who aren't performing and like go into that whole mindset of like we're really going to grind on on cold sales um it's not like my instinct to run the company that way and to kind of be set up that way. So yeah, we haven't done, done as much of that, but not, not impossible. We'd go down that road road if we could find kind of the right angle that I thought worked for us. But, um, but again, I also feel like that's maybe one of those angles that's, uh, you know, just other competitors could probably do better. And I don't know if that's going to be where we're going to be able to sort of bring something unique there, but who knows possibly. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't discredit it. I I think uh, yeah. I've done you know every business I've done, I've always kind of like built it off of cold outreach and like kind of oh, SEO and and you know like inbound like you know PPC stuff is always like mm-hmm. the second biggest channel, and then you know eventually once the business gets going, then like referrals and partners and that sort of thing. But uh, right. yeah, I mean, I think um, cold outreach it's getting noisy. Like there, it's well, that's the thing. <laughs> so many in my mailbox i'm like how could this possibly work i don't know since but, 2020 it got really noisy but uh since yeah. the pandemic it got really noisy mm. but uh it still works i mean we still close deals all the time uh from mm. cold email and linkedin and yeah it comes in all the time so give give me your top two or three tips here so uh you you have to be very very specific so uh mm-hmm. your campaign has to be like so niche and so tailored and then you know like the sense. messaging has to be so niche and so tailored that mm-hmm. the person reading it questions if possibly like you actually hand wrote the email mm-hmm. uh don't do like links or or um or or like any you know images in the email like right, the just CTA, a plain just, white email yeah, plain white email, make it look like you sent it. And then uh, you, you can put like, you know, I'll, I'll put like font for the logo and just like color the font, the color of the brand. So it mm-hmm. kind of looks like a logo, but it's just like a font logo. Oh, right. Uh, and then, you know, just keep it like really stripped down, basic email, short, like, you know, three to five sentences, you know, do like five to seven touch points over a month or two. Right. And uh, you have to warm your inboxes. So like mm-hmm. there's a whole industry of like inbox warming. So you have to right. have like, reputation you don't want right. to do cold so email on like your spam. yeah the main you, domain or anything yeah you gotta <laughs> yeah do, do it on a separate domain and then you have to warm that and build reputation so there's a lot of yeah. little like nuance but if mm-hmm. you get past all the technical nuance and just get like right into like what works from like a human psychology standpoint right. it would be like let's say you ran a campaign and let's say it was like you know e-commerce businesses that you know have a like let's say you're like really good and you have a couple case studies of solving like some specific e-commerce need and you're like Mm -hmm. all right so our you can name drop a client you could say uh you know um bed bath and beyond or whatever like name drop a big client that people know and say you know like this one client that we solved this pain point for them Mm -hmm. by doing xyz this is this is how our solution handles that and i'd love to do a demo would you like to set up a call and just uh you know, right to the point, like just, you know, who you are, what the yep. pain, acknowledge their pain point, how you can solve it, and then, you know, request a, a call and a demo. Uh, I don't know. We might have to try that. That doesn't sound too bad. I think we can manage that part of it. Do you have a tool, a tool you like for this or what do you Oh, uh, there's so many. I mean, I, I use know, robots. There's, so many there's yeah, robots. there's uh, instantly there's uh, my friend built one called mail stand. Uh, there's, you know, there's a million of them. Uh, right. There's a bunch right. out there. And then you go. 
where you, you go LinkedIn kind of as your main source of finding people to mail or how does that go? Yeah, you can, there's tools to scrape from LinkedIn. Uh, you can also right. buy data services. Like there's Apollo is like the cheapest one, but their data quality is a little iffy. Uh, Zoom mm. Info is like the biggest one, but they're like, you know, 20 grand a year or something to have a license. Right. So it's expensive. Mm. Uh, Apollo is like hundred bucks a month or something. So yeah, there's a ton of tools out there like data broker uh, tools and you just kind of link it up to your sequencing software. You write a sequence and then you just run a bunch of campaigns, A-B test them. The campaigns are like, deep and never wide like you want it to be really deep right. in a subject matter and like specific yeah. like very specific pain point for a very specific industry to a very to a very specific job title at the company and even like right. down to like the size of the company like you're going to talk to you know a 2000 person billion dollar e-commerce company differently than you would talk to you know a 10 person you know 10 million dollar right. e-commerce company yeah that makes sense all right, might be on the list here. It doesn't sound too bad. Maybe we'll give it a shot. Maybe we'll give yeah, it a man. shot. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so moving on, uh, we, we briefly touched on social media. I'm curious. You have like a respectable Twitter following, I think. You you have like a you know a little bit of a you know like yeah, ecosystem going. Uh, what, what do you think about the whole like X and uh, you know Elon Musk transition on on uh, X dot com? I mean, I'll, you know, I'm in the Elon's insane camp, so I don't know. I think he's, <laughs> you know, I don't have anything too much good to say about him. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think whatever. I think what I think's been interesting <laughs> is you know, so I think he was. I every single decision he made, I think, was wrong. Um, since he took it over, but I will say. Uh, one of the, a favor that was done for him, I think, was uh, Meta releasing Threads because I feel like since then, actually, he's sort of not done anything too crazy with Twitter. Um, I know he might have changed the name after that point, but he said he was going to change the name from the beginning. I mean, I think the name's terrible. I think calling it X is ridiculous. People can't even like talk about it. Like it's a weird. It's hard to say, right? <laughs> like it's uh, you can't say you it with write a about place. it. Yeah, and people write about it, and they're like X, and then they always have to put in parentheses like Twitter because like nobody knows like just a letter. It's stupid, but um, but yeah. So I think since then he's been like kind of leveled out a little bit. So I feel like that's good news. It's like a little competition, maybe kind of got him straightened out. Um, and he he did say he's going to make everybody pay the other day, which I think is very unlikely to work. Uh, but I guess we'll see. I I mean, I like tried threads. There's of, nothing going on on threads. It's totally yeah. I, I, you know, I really like threads in general, um, but they made a huge mistake. They had a moment to strike there and people were really excited about it when it came out, but they didn't have any web view where you could, uh, or like you can't create on the web view. Right. And so I think they did just release it pretty recently that you could, but you know, I just feel like the thing with the, any of these services, is like 99% of the people are just reading. But 1% of the people have to actually make the content for everybody to read, right? And like doing that on your phone kind of sucks it's in like Twitter world. And I just feel like a lot of people use their desktop or they use like um, API-based tools. And since it had no API and it didn't have a web-based tool, I feel like it made it really hard for people to move over. And so then they didn't move over. Um, and now I don't know if, if Elon sort of calms down a little bit and just like runs it the way it used to be essentially. And like, you know, whatever I'll do is stuff around the edges, but if he doesn't totally implode it, um, then I don't know. It might be, might be kind of hard for them. It is hard to have multiple social networks that kind of overlap. I think, you know, it's like LinkedIn has its lane fine and Twitter has its lane and Facebook has its lane, but threads and Twitter on the same lane could be, could be tricky. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I'm set up over there too. I'm Edge still waiting for this uh, this Zuck and Musk cage fight, man. Once yeah. uh, man, That, <laughs> that might gonna... settle the feud once and for all. I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I don't but, know. Uh, yeah, I keep I keep seeing uh, Zuck Zuck posting about it that he's like, "Hey, I'm still waiting for the date." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't think I don't think it's gonna happen. I would love oh, to see it. I mean, I think Zuck would kick his butt, but uh, seems unlikely to happen. Yeah, it would be he's, fun though. Musk is a lot bigger, but uh, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, Zuck is training though, so I mean, yeah, I, Zuck's I, like really in shape, and Elon's really not in shape. So I don't know. Did Here you see go. the I'm thing when Zuck? They they launched. I think it was when they launched the X.com rebrand, or they launched something. And mm. he posted a he posted a live stream of him in the Twitter office, like curling a uh, dumbbell. I didn't see it. Oh, oh, 
Oh, the, and then, I mean, that's even funny, right? Like the X.com rebrand, except you can't go to X.com and use Twitter, right? Like it's still Twitter.com. So like, it's, there's like all this, it was obviously just like he said in the afternoon, like, all right, we're doing it. Like change the logos and the names and like, they went you can't use Twitter on X.com. No, I don't think you can. Um, I think they had some redirects link go through there, but like the domain is twitter.com where you still get like sent to for any actual interactions. Oh, yeah. So it just redirects. Yeah. yeah so like cool. they haven't actually moved the service to x.com. Yeah. But, I mean, x.com is a good, I like it way better as a domain than the name of Twitter. Uh, I'm a, kind of a domain guy. So X, you know, a single letter.com domain is an impressive domain. Like that. Yeah. I mean, that would probably life, be, I would have to imagine like at least a hundred million dollar domain thing, you know, something like that. Especially X is kind of a cool letter and whatever. It's a little different. Yeah. So 50 million, hundred million, who knows? Something like that. I just, I just opened up, that... uh, I opened up X.com and the first tweet in my thread is from you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm tweeting while we're on here. I'm not, I don't know. Um. Uh. Oh, I oh, I saw an interesting thing the other day. We're way off topic here, but uh, <laughs> Amazon owns like almost five billion dollars in uh, IPv4 addresses because there's just like wow. so much demand for IPv4 addresses, and uh, they don't. You know, they're out of ad- like the world is out of them. They're all filled, so there's only the ones that exist, and you know, AWS is, buys them up, but, um, you know, they've been buying them for a long time and what they're selling for in the blocks that you buy them in, uh, you know, it's like crazy. A friend of mine, like a year and a half ago was like, you got to buy some IP addresses. And I'm like, I'm not buying any IP addresses. Like, I don't want to deal with it, whatever. And they're, they're up like three or four X or something crazy, like, um, in 12 months or 18 months. So yeah, there's a whole world of how the internet works out there. That's kind of, kind of wild, but yeah, a friend of mine just launched a new company that needs a lot of IP addresses, and mm. uh, it's like a platform company, and it's uh, so hard. He's telling me the stories about how he has to keep going to all these different cloud service providers, and then he has to like beg them, and they'll give right. him like thirty at a time. And... <laughs> yeah, it's, they're they're like rare commodities, and you have IPv6, which like is whatever you can have like more addresses than atoms in the universe or whatever, but you know a lot of stuff doesn't work with it still. Like a lot of end, um, I think a lot of like isps and stuff is not like fully supported and, and things like that so yeah no one's using v6 that i know of yeah because i think there are still these like problems with actually getting in like older devices and older systems that obviously just don't know about it so nobody really wants to switch over and have things not work for customers so there's i think the ipv4 addresses i think they're just going to be getting more and more valuable and at some point everybody will be forced to switch and then you know, then their value will definitely crater. But I think it's going to be, I think we got a little more run in it. I wish I had bought some some IP addresses. So yeah. so right here, right now on this podcast, we're telling you to remortgage your house and buy V4 I mean, IPs. Maybe, that might be the best <laughs> takeaway of the whole podcast so far is go buy some IP addresses. Just That's kidding. A that was a joke. Thing. Don't, don't do that if you're the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> maybe, maybe don't mortgage your house, but you might, you might want to buy some addresses. I don't know. I think you have to That's buy good, 256 at a time or something. They're sold in like some kind of block like that. Um, and it's like 20 grand or something for the block. Uh, Holy so crap. Really? Yeah. That much? It's, that's a, yeah. It's crazy. They're yeah, I think expensive. my friend said he's paying like a hundred dollars or $80 a month per address. Right. Yeah. That's nuts. That's a nice recurring revenue business right there. Like if we yeah. had a block of them, <laughs> no customer service, no anything like hundred bucks a month in address. Let's go. Yeah, that, that is crazy. Um, yeah. There's so many weird things in the world like that. Like there's just yeah. like when you dive into like an, an industry and you like get into the nitty gritty of it, there's like all these opportunities that just like the further you go in, the more you just find all this like weird stuff about how the world works. Yeah, yeah it is, that is amazing. Like once you start to think in that mindset too, I just like see it everywhere. I'm like, oh, this should be a business or this is a business. That's really cool. Like some weird thing, right? That's just niche to an industry or a region even or whatever and uh yeah i don't know for i've tried i've gotten better about it but i used to not even be able to like go out to dinner or anything i'd just be like in the restaurant like analyzing the sort of business of this restaurant we're in and like <laughs> what do you think how many people are walking by and i don't know you know the prices of the dishes and like well you know everything about it the location and who's working there and all that stuff dude i do that all the time and yeah. <laughs> uh my wife gets so mad at me i have to like 
you know, if we're out on date night or like we're hanging out, I have to like, purposefully shut that part off of me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> put the business brain away for a little bit. Yeah, let's put this thing over here on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's cool. Um, so, all right, so let's change gears. You have an interesting mm. story you told me about. You teased it out. I don't know the story, but this, uh, you said early in your consulting career, you got a juicy hot take story for the the pod here. So I, I want to, you know, hear, hear what you got. <laughs> yeah, so I had, I've done two just pure consulting, uh, consulting, you know, uh, agreements in my life. And so I started at this like internet company. I said, you know, I worked that I was doing e-learning stuff and that's where I learned the program. Um, and so I was like, okay, well I'll make some side money doing consulting or whatever. And so I, the guy kind of like across the street from our offices was doing web, you know, websites for real estate agents and things like that. And he outsourced to me and this is like, 2001 something like that he outsourced to me to like implement this website for like 200 dollars. so i spent you know a month working on this or three weeks a month and you know made 200 dollars. and i was like okay like that didn't seem like it was worth it whatever so yeah i don't really do much with the consulting i'm kind of already on to like products because i'm like uh, i gotta find a product um and we're iterating on lots of ideas before coming up with help spot and so this other opportunity came up to do another consulting project and it was $6,000 to implement this like database driven sort of, uh, it was actually like a conference submission system to like submit uh, proposals to a conference. And I was like, all right, $6,000, that's that's pretty real. That's that's good. And so, you know, I was like, okay, it's going to take like a couple of weeks, whatever. And the thing just went on. It went on for like seven, eight months. I never made any more money than $6,000. I was working like 15, 20 hours a week on this thing. And I didn't know what I was doing. Like, I didn't like charge them more money. I didn't like stop and force them to pay me more money. Like, I just finished it, even though they kept changing everything and needing more stuff and whatever. And then after that, I was like, nah, that's it. Like, no more consulting for me. That's the end of my consulting. I'm never doing any consulting again. Uh, and then I was like, we just really got to make the products work. And luckily, the products did. So it's fine. But uh, yeah. The consulting, it wasn't for me. I mean, I didn't, I didn't knew nothing about it. That was 2001. There wasn't even any information about it, right? There's nobody to learn from. There's nobody doing podcasts about it or anything else. But uh, yeah, it was just like, man, so hard. Even now when we do professional services and stuff for people, I feel like we probably aren't really optimizing that as well as it could be. It's probably, probably not uh, as much revenue generator as it might be, but I know I have a hard time with it. I'm, I think there's like that mindset to it. And I'm just, I don't have that mindset. There's something, something off with me about that. Yeah. I mean, it's consulting's tough. I mean, I, you know, you, you know, Hero Tech's a professional services company and uh, right. it's, I mean, it, it's like an art form to uh, contain, you know, to like estimate a scope. Yeah. Um, come in, you know, on your estimate and contain the scope, not let it creep outside, but also like keep the customer happy. So you're trying to like fight the, you know, like the scope creep, yeah. but also not, you know, make the customer unhappy in the same process. So it's like this really like narrow, like you're kind of like dancing on the edge of a blade trying to right. keep, like f fighting like both competing forces. And it's 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 an art. I think that's the art form of professional services. That's that's definitely like. A, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, well, I was going to say there to me, there's also this, the art form of it, too, is and this is related to that, but even just internally, because like to me. Like when I'm building a product, uh, there I, I think it's like a very artistic uh, pursuit to develop a product. And so I go in there and like I could have pre-written spec and all that stuff, whatever. Like once I'm in there and I'm touching the code and it's doing things, like I'm going to be like, no, we should do this. This should be different. I have this whole other idea, right? I'm going to go down that path a little bit. And but like I, that's bad if you have a consulting project because it's like we've been hired to do this thing. Here's the scope. Here's what we're doing. Like, not that they there's no room to like improve it in things, but at the same time, like you have to actually deliver. And that the other way, the way I tend to want to do it, definitely leads you away from like timelines and all those sort of things. Like you know, I can just get off off of uh, my prioritization, and so I always am. Uh, very impressed with people who are able to do that and be like, nope, like, here's this thing. I'm going to implement it. I did it. It's done well. It's delivered. I'm on to the next thing. 
um because i cannot do that like just everything i'm in i'm just like okay what about this over here and like maybe we should do this differently over there and you know then often it doesn't ship at all <laughs> i've definitely had things not ship because i've uh, gotten distracted so i mean you're totally set. you're totally describing like the entire you know process working with a customer in a professional services company it starts right. with like first you have to build their confidence that you and your team are the right team to do it. And then you have to yeah. build their trust that, you know, like you can, you're going to do what you say you're, what you say you're going to do and that you have their best interests at, at yeah. heart. And then once you can establish the confidence and the trust, then you can move them into uh, engagement that allows for that, like allows mm. for that create that creative and artistic mm. journey. Because it, you're exactly right. Like building software, building, you know, digital products, it's not something yeah. that you can spell out. You're not placing an order for pens and paper clips. Like right. it's, you, know, you have to. <laughs> you be don't able know to, what like, you're getting necessarily. Like once you get in there and people use it, there's always things that that change. Yeah, platform changes. You know, use, right. use cases, industry changes. You know, there's all sorts of things like just unforeseen complexity that yeah. arises through the process. So, I think like a lot of the ways that really successful software firms are doing it now is that they're treating the engagements as like an agile engagement where mm. essentially instead of giving them like all right here's the cost to build this thing and here's how long it's going to take and then inevitably it's going to go over right. uh what you can do is you can treat it as like an agile uh like run rate so you've got like a monthly mm -hmm. you, you're putting together a team and you're putting together a monthly cost for that team and the client is you know they have to trust that you know that like you're you're going to be able to deliver it and you know the timelines are going to be somewhat reasonable because it, if it mm. just keeps going then the cost just keeps ballooning right <laughs> so they have to trust that the cost isn't going to keep ballooning but then they also have to trust that you know if there's pushback you know from the professional services firm that it's for a reason and you know there's a conversation that then yep. develops and you have to kind of like it's a push and pull but you know it has to be like a you know like a uh uh you know, like in, in partnership, like that push and pull has to exist mm. in a partnership between the, you know, the the uh, the owner of the product and the, then the product development agency. Yep. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. Building it. it that's a, such a tricky thing, too, to like build that trust and that relationship over, you know, a relatively short amount of time, especially in the beginning. Obviously, if you have a longer engagement than that, that builds out. But um, yeah. That's, I mean, there's cool aspects to that too, of like being able to work on different stuff all the time. I mean, I've been working on the same product for 18 years or whatever it's been. So that at times, you know, gets difficult to be like really excited about it. And it's like, how do you do that? You know, different things we can do to make it exciting, or you just focus on different parts of the product, which is what I tend to do, like get obsessed with the website for a while or get obsessed with marketing for a while or different things like that. And then come back to the product itself. But, um, so that is a part of consulting I always thought is really interesting is just like, oh, I have a new project to work on, you know, every month or a couple times a year at least, or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah. Yeah, it's cool. It's always like I, I always hear um, you know, like SaaS companies, if they're like struggling to find product market fit, they're always thinking about like pivoting to something that's more services oriented, generate revenue right. and services companies are always inevitably trying to think about how they can productize what they're doing right. and then, you know, <laughs> delve into the SaaS world. So it's like, grass is always there's greener. always like a grass is greener uh, yeah. mentality. I see that <laughs> sure. all the time. I know everybody I know in consulting, they're always like... We need a SaaS. We need, we need the recurring revenue. But very <laughs> few of them ever actually build one. Um, but it is the only like base camp. I don't know. Yeah, I know. I just feel like time wise, it just gets hard because it's like, well, you have these people and they're working on paying customers and you can, it's hard to take two or three people off a team or whatever and send them off on another journey for six months or whatever it is. But uh, that's the other thing too, like building the products only like the first phase and there's so much other stuff that goes into it. Like we were talking about whether it's marketing or the you know, inevitable kind of like finding the product market fit of like tweaks and things over time to really dial in the product. It's like just getting it to work is one thing, but then actually making it a, you know, a great product that people want to use and pay money for and all that stuff. And then to learn about it, that it even exists. Uh, those are all, you know, a lot more steps involved in the, the making it a there. business part. <laughs> right, the making it a business part, it like starts the day you get it to actually work. And then you have to like, uh go from there with it so yeah you're kind of just at the beginning once you've got the code in place so yeah yeah for sure 
Um, all right. So uh, I did want to touch on uh, Lara Jobs. Like that's another one of your companies. Uh, it's a job board business. And uh, I keep hearing really interesting things about job board businesses. They're like super uh, like high profit. They're like really uh, like, you know, they they scale really well. Like, you know, mm-hmm. maybe like the revenue side and like the, you know, like the two-sided marketplace might be the limiter, but like, you know, actually scaling the business, it's like a single website. It's super easy to manage and scale it. Uh, and I've seen them yeah. like, you know, there's some really interesting, uh, you know, roll ups of these things too. I've seen like uh, Andrew Wilkinson mm. from Tiny has the WeWork yeah, remotely. They have like three or four. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like these job, like this job board space is like really hot uh, lately. I've seen. Uh, how's uh, like, you know, tell, tell me about Lara Jobs. Like, how, how's that been for you? Yeah, it's been great. So we built it um, with, again, it's like 10 years old um, when Taylor, who, built Laravel, worked at my company um, for three years, and uh, we built Lara Jobs then. So I've ran Lara Jobs since then. Um, And we partner very closely with Laravel News, who uh, is kind of like sort of the marketing end of it um, in terms of just exposing it to to kind of Laravel developers and people in the Laravel space. Um, Yeah, you know, the there is a lot of job board activity. I mean, definitely a couple of years ago, it was totally insane. Like during kind of mid COVID there, where just like, there was just funny money everywhere and people were hiring just unlimited numbers of uh, developers. Um, it was kind of nuts. Uh, and definitely, I mean, the the sort of architecture is incredibly easy, of course, because it's just like literally like a row in a database. And uh, usually in the modern style, it's like a single web page with jobs listed on it. And so that part is super um, nice and there's like very low customer service and things like that. Um, The main problem with it is just like, it's very chicken or the egg because like you can't get the people who want the jobs if there aren't the people who have the jobs listing the jobs. Um, But the people who list the jobs don't want to pay money to list the jobs because you don't have anybody there who wants to uh, apply for jobs. And so how do you make that work you kind of have to simultaneously get people listing jobs and then also have the eyeballs on it so that's kind of the main thing with it is if you can find and you know there's a lot of big competitors now and stuff too so um it is kind of like you were saying with the cold email it's like lara jobs is like super niche down it's like if you want to hire laravel developers like that's what we specialize in like those are the eyeballs we go after um we're not out there even on like tailwind or these other sort of semi-related things it's like nope like the every job pretty much is a laravel job there are a few exceptions but for the vast vast majority of jobs is some way laravel related and uh which does help you a lot because like then you can partner with like like in our case like laravel.com links to us and laracast links to us and we have this partnership with laravel news and so uh you know that all works and it's a strong story to go to those people in those places and be like you know this is and in our case we're like the official job board so we're the official job board of laravel and you know you should work with us um kind of thing uh where you know so if you have any industry where you have some type of connection to it uh and you can kind of get those initial elements rolling then yeah it's it's a good business i mean it's not you know, it's not a humongous moneymaker. Like it's much smaller than HelpSpot and things like that. So I kind of, you know, it's nice extra revenue. So I I don't uh, scoff at that. And then, uh, but I also personally, in my particular case, like it's also a community service I view it as. So it's like, you know, I'm not going to get rich running this site, uh, but it's like a cool thing to have for the community. That's like just a website. It's not just like you're up on dice.com or, whatever any of these just like mega job boards or even the we work remote and those type of things which are just like yeah you could put a laravel job up there and it's mixed in with you know rail jobs and python jobs and everything else it's like if you really want to work not just in php not just as a programmer in general but like you really want to work on laravel in your day job like then then this is the job board for that so the quality is um, better too. I mean, we've hired a ton of people uh, at Caratech oh, off of jobs. So I yeah, it. I mean, it's the quality I think is way better than any other job board I've ever used. Uh, yeah, I think that's true too. Again, that, that niching down really helps because like we're just really going out to like people who read Laravel news, people who go to, you know, these Laravel community websites. And it's like, those are the kind of people you're going to want working on your Laravel job, right? Whereas if you're just kind of more on these big job boards, we have 
first of all, you just get so much more junk applications, um, which always bothers me when I have a job up. It's like, uh, you know, just like 95% of the applicants are just like, you, they're not even, you can't even consider them because it's just like, I don't know if it's automated or what it is, but there's like a lot of bad job applicants uh, these days. But, um, but yeah, and then you're just not lost, mixed in with a bunch of just people who are programmers and maybe they know PHP. And so now they're just applying and it's not that they're bad or anything like that, but they're not maybe the best fit. Um, they're not necessarily like excited about Laravel. Uh, they're not necessarily like following Taylor on Twitter and learn, you know, being right on top of, you know, what's new and different things they can take advantage of. And so, yeah, I think when you do do that hiring through something like Lara jobs, it's like, no, you know, those are the people applying through there. It's like, they are the ones who see the jobs and are like, yeah, I'm, I'm literally trying to find a job using Laravel. I'm in the community. I'm, you know, part of the community. I'm contributing in different ways. Like, uh, so yeah, I think that does make a really, a really big difference there, but always good to hear. I love, I love to hear it. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great platform. <laughs> uh, so you you hired Taylor at one point too, right? He, he mm -hmm. was working at HelpSpot, or what? Uh, what did you hire him for? Yeah, so he was working. We ended up building some other products back then. Um, so he worked on those. He worked on just Laravel a lot. So like initially, he worked on Laravel, and I was just paying him to work on Laravel because when I found, uh, you know, I've been looking for kind of like what we're going to do future projects on uh, in terms of like uh, frameworks. And, you know, this is like whatever it was, 10 or 12 years ago. And, um, you know, everybody was kind of big on Rails and all that stuff. And I was like, I really don't want to go to Rails. Don't like Rails. I like PHP. I just want to stay in PHP. And there were more frameworks than when I had started, but it was still, you know, there wasn't the kind of definitive one. And all of them had these weird sort of quirks and things. And I found Laravel. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. This is like exactly what I want. Like the documentation, even back then, was great which is i think what version was it on when you found him it was i think it was late version two um i believe or he had wow. like or was just about to come out with version three i think like version three came out i can't remember if version three came out right before he started or right after he started but it was like right in there um yeah and so i was like and then i randomly seen him uh have some post on some like code tree or something where it said he was available. So I just like approached him and was like, Hey, like I'm looking to hire a developer. And I think it'd be cool if you worked on Laravel because you know, Laravel didn't have a bunch of things that you really need for these more enterprise type apps at that point. Like um, it didn't have like caching. It didn't have, uh, you know, all kind all, all, any authorization stuff. I don't think didn't have um, like the ORM. I remember like he went and rewrote the ORM one day. Like he just went into this like sort of crazy zone and like came out at, like two days later. And he's like, he's like, I've got it. He had like eloquent, and it was you know all amazing. And uh, I didn't realize but, that you you uh, actually hired. So did you, did you have him working on HelpSpot, or did you just hire him to work on Lar Laravel at the time? Uh, yeah, so he was going to work on like help spot slash other products. Um, and then, and then also Laravel. So for the first like three months or four months, I think he did just almost entirely work on Laravel. And then we kind of got some of these things that was missing in place. Cause it was a little bit more initially as like a light, you know, that was kind of like the trend at the time was like these lighter frameworks. Um, although I think he did always even then have like the aspiration of them being, uh, you know, of it being a full featured framework. But, you know, he did have a day job at the time, and I think he was, like, writing ASP and COBOL and stuff like that. Um, so he was just kind of chipping away at night on it. So, yeah, so he got more time at Userscape, which is, like, the actual company name. Um, and then he was doing some help spot stuff, and we built this other product that actually didn't work out, but he was, a, you know, developed a lot of that. And so... Uh, yeah, and we were also doing other stuff like running the first conferences. Um, that was all while he was at my company. We did the first couple Laracons, which was really cool. Like the first one was like 90 people. Um, that's so cool. So, yeah, yeah, was, I did, really I knew cool you experience. were involved in the early days. I didn't realize that like you were that involved. That, that's really yeah. cool. Uh, yeah, really, that really story. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was really cool. Um, it was really cool to be there from the beginning, and uh, yeah, like it's it's worked out great. Like, it's like I just love that. Like, Oh, I have Laravel to use. I'm just, this is all I'm ever going to use. I'm never switching to anything else. I just use Laravel and that's it. Like, uh, and it's exactly what I had hoped it would become. And uh, Taylor's obviously 
has an amazing vision for it and done, you know, just gone so far above and beyond what we could have even imagined back then, I think. But uh, yeah, it's kind of become the de facto sort of framework in, in the space. So it's an incredible ecosystem cool. too. I've never seen any yeah. ecosystem like it in any other open source uh, community. Yeah. Yeah, the ecosystem's great. You have other companies that are doing like heavy contributions, both like Laravel itself, but also like I mean, you have like Spatty with all its like packages, and you have like um, tons of individual developers with like just amazing, you know, not just packages they've thrown up, but like really in depth, well done, well documented um, packages that have you know thousands of GitHub stars, and uh, you have obviously all the people doing content and training and from Laracast, of course, the big one, but there's still lots of other ones too. People doing all kinds of community training and things free paid, you know, you have like something for everybody. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really remarkable what's gone on with it. It's yeah. Really, it's super really cool. We, we picked it up at Kiro tech. I think somewhere like halfway through version four, uh, is when we okay, started. Yeah. So that's really did, early. Uh, first project that was what like 2015 or something or 2016 or yeah probably something there. like 2015 and yeah version four was like where it, yeah kind of like we factored very heavily um internally with like the illuminate components and things and uh yeah it was like a big kind of turning point i think where it really started Took to off. take off yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, this wouldn't be a tech podcast if I didn't ask you what you're doing with AI these days. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So AI. So AI is very interesting. Like, uh, because you know, help desk is literally like the sort of in theory, absolutely perfect use case. It's like, well, maybe you don't even need a help desk anymore. Maybe you don't even need agents anymore, right? Like the AI is just gonna like answer all the questions. So um yeah, so I've definitely been very much on top of the AI stuff. We do have some AI in help spot, uh, but there's definitely going to be more to be done there. I think, you know, it's like any tech where I think initially it's like, whoa, super exciting. Like your mind just goes to like all the possibilities. And then when you start to really dig in, it's like, well, it's not all the way there yet. You know, it's like it can't actually really answer all your questions yet of like very specific business use case. Like there are ways to to sort of do it with the, like, you know, you have your vector database and you're trying to pull out like components and throw it in and have the AI make a nice human reply to it and everything. So, uh, you know, it's not really fast yet for the better models. <laughs> so there's some things there. So I think, uh, you know, part of the stuff as we're getting into like reworking parts of help spot and things, it's like, you know, where does it make sense to use it? Where does it make sense? I'm actually kind of more interested. So there's like the like obvious, it improves your writing or it writes things for you and which is cool but i i'm kind of more interested in like internally in the application like where we can use ai to like yeah same auto categorize something or do some something that we would have done with code logic that can we like have the ai do that and it actually does it better than what we were going to like code up um even more so than just like yes the interface is like magical and cool but that's sort of like We've That's been doing that for like clients at, uh, yeah, we, we've been, been doing going. that for clients at Cura. It's like, I can't share like specific use cases on sure. the air, but like, that's exactly like what I'm most excited about is right. what you just said, like using it inside the application for like data sorting or for yeah. like, you know, uh, displaying content inside the app in a certain way or right. like, you know, things that, you know, it's just wouldn't be possible previously. And like, I think the real big innovation curious to get your thoughts on this but i think the real big innovation isn't like like in 2023 late 2022 it wasn't like ai ai has been around for i mean the concept of ai i think it's been around for you know like 40 years or something but right. uh you know like uh these like transformers like tensorflow and these things have been around for over a decade i think google yeah. open sourced uh you know tensorflow in what like 2015 or something or yeah, 2014 something. Was a while ago yeah 2010 but uh so these tools have been around, like companies have been building AI tools, you know, you know, it's been more underground, I think, but the real innovation yeah. is what OpenAI did, building it into a platform API layer. So it's like, right. you know, before you racked, we talked earlier, like before it was like you racked your servers and then AWS comes right. out. Now you just like put in a credit card and spin up, you know, instances. And that's like what, yep. what happened this year is that like platform platformatization of, of AI technology. 
Yeah, I think you're totally right. I mean, to me, the two, I mean, even ahead of that for them, of like what they just did magically was like just just putting chat.openai.com or whatever it is up there of like that to give you that way to just try it, like just a seamless way to try it and be like blown away that it could respond to you so eloquently and stuff, I think was just to capture people's imagination. And then, yes, and then you're like, oh, there's actually an API for this. And like, yeah, I can just put my credit card in and start sending it data and it sends me back results. And that's amazing. Um, so yeah, I think that all that, and obviously now there's going to be, I mean, obviously there's even things like hugging face and whatever, where you can have all the API, all the models, you know, available as an API and things like that. So that's something we're just really early on. I don't know if you've done a lot with this there, but like, really like trying to figure out the right models for the different use cases. Like not everything's going to need GPT-4, like other things going to be faster. And if I'm just asking it to like categorize something, like I probably don't need the eloquent response as long as it does, you know, it can reasonably do that categorization and things like yeah, that. One of the ones other uh, tasks it can do. One of the ones we built is exactly what you're saying, where it's like we took all the client's data and put it in Pinecone, like a vector store. Mm -hmm. And then I think there was also some hugging face model involved. I, I wasn't I wasn't in like the engineering level of the the client or the project, but uh, they had like the the client's data vectorized. Mm -hmm. And then there was I think a hugging face model, and we would do like the use case specific stuff there. Right. And then we'd run it through OpenAI's uh, three point five Turbo or the GPT four right, uh, to actually eight. spit it out. Yeah, to make it like you know sound good, presentable. Like, it, like, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we're we're definitely gonna be looking at stuff like that. It's like I think there is an element of that that's gonna be really interesting of like the trade offs involved of like speed and money, um, and what you actually needed to do and being set up to yeah have it work with different models for different types of tasks and things. Um, and I think eventually we'll just get to where you know, it, whatever, there's going to be, you know, there'll be every year, it's going to be cheaper, of course, and faster. And so, yeah, they'll just be something they'll just be able to go to the one and just buy it and be done with it. But I don't think we're quite there yet. And then also, I mean, the real thing everybody really wants to me, and it might internally work even the way it works now, where like there's a vector database and then it pulls out the components from that and shoves it as a prompt and all that fun. But what I really, really want is I just want to go to open AI and I just want to shove all the data in there. And then I want it to do all that stuff. And then I just ask it questions through the regular API and not me have to like run my own vector database and first they search against that, that and do that. Do they have that? They have the yeah, fine tuning it's stuff, AI but it's enterprise. a little different. Open AI. Enterprise. I did sign up just, for that enterprise. It just came out. I'm not yeah. in yet. Um, I think that's a little bit different though, but maybe not. I'm not in it yet, unfortunately, but I want it. Yeah, I think you can upload your data and they store it privately and in a, like mm. a compliant, like a SOC 2 compliant way so that right. your data doesn't make it into their model and it's like stored in, you know, SOC 2 compliant data centers and yep. yada, yada, yada. And then I think you can run G their GPT-4, uh, you know, they, they, they basically have like a They've GPT done the integration. Yeah, like a private cloud basically is what I think what they're right. doing. Yeah, so I mean, I think that's obviously what everybody wants, right? Nobody wants to run Pinecone. Like, that's a big pain in the butt. Like, that's just a whole separate thing. I don't want to have a whole separate infrastructure. Like, I just want to go, especially when it's all going in the end to OpenAI anyway. Like, I just want to send it all to OpenAI initially and then be able to ask it questions or, you know, commands or whatever I want to do. So, um, yeah, I think we're, we'll get there actually pretty quickly. Uh, what you mentioned though before too is really interesting about this is that all this stuff has been around and they've been doing it and people have been saying it's cool and but like it just didn't capture people's imagination exactly you know and so it's like it is unlike other tech which is normally like it might be more at the beginning and you have to wait years and years for the tech to become more fully real like even with the iphone like it was amazing in the beginning but it also like the video sucked and the photo sucked and it had no memory and the apps kind of dunk you know and like now the iphone's unbelievable right so you've gone that full it's been 15 years or whatever and now it's amazing but this has kind of got this head start where it's like oh no like people have been building stuff for 10 years like pinecone already exists right like all these this infrastructure around the ai stuff already exists and it's just like people waking up to that it's there um and then you know presumably like the future models are already well underway and all that kind of stuff so the iteration will be 
more quick, I think, than um, maybe it has in the past. But uh, yeah, I'm very excited about it. I, mean, I think there's definitely a lot of opportunity to do different things with it. Um, obviously, in the help desk space, there's just like an incredible amount of things that can be done with it. Um, and so, yeah, and I mean, just business-wise too, there's a whole interesting area of like the sort of amazing greed element to it. Like, um, cause obviously like one of the things you're going to be presenting customers potentially in a help desk scenario is like, well, you know, now you need less agents potentially. Um, I, I actually tend to think in general, I don't know about specifically for customer service, but I do think in general, AI, much like almost all tech, isn't so much that it like replaces a bunch of jobs, but it just makes everybody more efficient, which then makes more jobs. And then that kind of builds up as opposed to it being like where a bunch of people are out of work because of it. I think it won't be that at all. Like that's what people thought about word processors too. And every other tech was like, oh, now we don't need a room full of people to type up the things in quadruple, right? We can, and or Xerox machines or all those things. Everybody was like, this is going to destroy all these jobs. And, you know, it doesn't, um, it just expands what's possible. So I still think that's true here, but you definitely see in companies pushing more of that angle directly or indirectly. And so like Intercom, who's, you know, another quasi help desk, they do other stuff too, but, um, you know, their AI chatbot is, you know, being charged by the answer, which I think is sort wow. of a radical idea and it's 99 cents an answer. Which I think is sort of insane because it's like, That's I mean, help, yeah, I hope those people don't make a ton of money, right? So, I mean, even a full time one at a good company, I mean, maybe they're making 50,000 or 60,000 or 80,000, you know, you know, it's a, there's a range there, but like, um, you know, if you're charging a dollar an answer, like you're a, trying to take a very large percentage of the savings that you think this company is going to get. And I mean, how many that, answers does a person do in a day? I mean, you could do, I mean, it depends a lot, of course, on the type of questions and things, but I mean, like you could definitely do or... oh, more than that, way more than that. So 80? like, yeah, you could do 50, 80, um, some could do hundreds, some could do, you know, less depending on, you know, again, it's like, is it phone calls? Is it something where you can more multitask like email support? Um, so there are, there are a lot of differences there. If you're, are you somebody who specializes in harder things in the company, you might only do one a day or two a day. So there is a so that's like but this, yeah if you're this doing AI like 60... bot's not going to do the hard ones anyway this ai bot in the current state of ai anyway is going to be more towards like more straightforward questions and things like that so so if you so if it's doing if it's replacing somebody who does 50 a day i mean 50 dollars a day is pretty hefty <laughs> the charge so I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's their real price, right? You never know if it's like, yeah, that's the sucker price. And then anybody doing any kind of real volume can go to them and be like, I'm not paying 99 cents. Um, well, I was just I was thinking through that uh, and I, I, I just added it up. It's like 13 to 15 K a year. Then uh, right. if for what, like it, if you're replacing one many? person, it's like 13 to 15 K. And right. like, there's this concept I've heard, uh, you know, around SaaS where, you know, it's like a it, VCs talk about it where they say you should be charging somewhere between 10 to 30% of the value you create for the customer. Right. And like that math lines right it's up. Like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> they've got the playbook and they're running it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it'll be interesting because I think a lot of these things are going to get so much cheaper and stuff too, though. Like there's going to be a lot of competitive pressure on them. I feel like uh, if they can actually sustain that um, again, they're selling very much to the enterprise at this point. Like they're not really for, smaller customers in a lot of ways at this point at least they're not geared toward that they definitely have plans where you could yeah where you could you could sign up and just be one person with your little company absolutely but that's not like their focus right they're like a huge company they're trying to close million dollar deals and so you know in those situations the price also becomes less important again like it kind of goes to that like the price is super important and then it gets the price is less important like the bigger you get because you know, once you're up into the millions, there's other factors at play. There's bigger numbers on the customers. And so, um, you know, so maybe they'll be fine charging that. But I did think it was it was definitely shocking to me that they were going to try to absorb a very high percentage of that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. We'll we'll see. Who knows how it does? I, don't, I haven't tried it. It might be terrible. It might be awesome. I don't know. Yeah, I'm totally going to watch that because that's really interesting. Uh, yeah, that's like a total uh, disruption of, to pricing model for sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot going uh, on out there. It's interesting. A lot of yeah, change. this was a hell of a podcast. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Did you clear your cash
ですね。